So today we have the pleasure of having Professor Larry Phillips from the London School of Economics. I am delighted to have him here because Larry was the great father, or great grandfather of decision science at LSE. And I, I had the pleasure of working with him for more than 10 years when I was at LSE. And uh, he's not only one of the founders of decision analysis, but also a visionary. And today he's talking about the future of decision analysis, I believe. And uh, I, we are really grateful, Larry, for having you here. Um, he has also uh, a group of colleagues that are going to be introduced that are working on the very exciting uh, virtual world of decision conferencing and um, decision analysis. Uh, and the team is Patrick Sherry, Paul Gordon, and Edward Put. And Professor Alberto Franco, my colleague, is kindly being the moderator today. So uh, back to Back to you, Alberto and Larry, and thank you again for this uh, opportunity. We are here to learn. We cannot hear you, Alberto. Thank you, Gilberto. Uh, today, uh, we have a very exciting webinar delivered by a very strong and experienced team. And so I would like to start by introducing formally our speakers. First of all, uh, Larry Phillips is a, an emeritus professor of decision sciences at the London School of Economics, and he's also director of Facilitations Limited. Larry will show us today uh, how integrating social and technical considerations makes decision analysis a truly socio-technical discipline. And then we were going to have uh, Patrick Shari, who is a professor from the Business School uh, at the University of New South Wales in Australia. He is an expert facilitator with extensive experience working with senior executives and diverse, across diverse industries. And then we have uh, Paul Gordon, who is uh, the CEO and Technical Director of Catalyze Asia Pacific, who is working on transforming the way the, way the world makes decisions uh, that matter by using structured, uh, conscious, collaborative, transparent decision-making processes. And finally, we have Edward Put, who is also a Director of Catalyze Asia Pacific, and leads the New Zealand operation. And Edward's roles include facilitation, design, and implementation of decision making and decision support processes, uh, senior client and stakeholder engagement, program management, and business development. Now, before we start, uh, briefly, uh, the format of the webinar will be as follows. First, uh, Larry will uh, start by giving a short presentation about decision conferencing. Then we're going to take a pause uh, and I'm going to take some questions uh, from the audience. Then I will give the floor to Patrick, uh, Paul, and Edward, who will also give a short presentation on using decision conferences in a virtual environment. And after that, we will make a second pause, take some questions from the audience before uh, wrapping up. So that's, that's the plan. Uh, and so without further ado, Larry, welcome. Uh, I would like to hand it over to you now. Alberto, thank you very much. And thank you, Gilberto, for that generous introduction. Um, I want to start by just cracking on beyond my first slide here. Um, let's just be reminded of the purpose of this webinar. It is to describe how a group of experts can work collaboratively and virtually on contentious issues that they face in their organization to create a decision analytic model that will help individuals facing the issues and deciding what to do next. Um, now, before I go any further, I want to uh, just first ask you a question. If somebody came up to you and said, what is a decision conference? Could you answer that question? Now think about that because we're going to open a poll and you have a chance to answer yes or no. Either you could answer the question, what is a decision conference or not? <clears throat> now, while that poll is operating, um, I discovered yesterday um, that we're very fortunate to have watching us actually the man who invented or discovered decision conferences, and that's Dr. Cameron Peterson, who uh, lives uh, atop a mountain um, in Colorado, just outside Boulder. Uh, he may even be sitting in the room that he had specially designed to run decision conferences. Uh, 
Cam discovered decision conferences in a way that was kind of accidental. Um, he was doing a decision conference when he was working as technical director of Decisions and Designs Incorporated, um, just outside Washington, D.C., a consultancy group. Um, and the Washington uh, Elevator Directorate, the, the managing director, uh, was uh, scheduled to come with a few experts to a conference uh, that um, what they called a contact meeting then, a contact meeting that would help them decide on the design of a new building so that they could actually test elevators, a building that could be have a tower in it that's say 20 stories tall. Um, much to Cam's surprise, on the day that the decision conference opened, which was the 2nd of May in 1979, um, 20 people showed up. He didn't bring just the experts, he brought his whole team. Well, um, that was uh, not at all the way he had normally worked. You know, many of us who are decision analysts go to a, an organization, uh, they ask us to help them solve a problem, we go around asking, asking people questions, we go away with the data, and then we come back, do, well, we do some modeling, and then we come back and uh, answer some questions. In other words, these, these contact meetings are to gather data, but that was not what happened at this decision conference. They actually constructed the model on the spot with all these people. And the surprising thing is that at the end of this decision conference, they were delighted that they had covered much of the material. A lot of the data were quite now clear. And best of all, everybody seemed to be aligned. In other words, it was um, important because it got buy-in to the team. And it's that buy-in by bringing people together that turned out in my career as a decision analyst to be the key. What we want to do is get that, because the biggest problem that many senior people have is getting everybody to pull in the same direction. On that point, Larry, I'd like to uh, give you the results of the poll. So uh, uh, you would like to know that uh, it, roughly about 60% of the audience actually uh, know what is a decision conference. They do know or don't know? They do, they do. They do know, oh, that's yeah. excellent. Well, that's more than I was expecting. I had been warned that uh, there are a lot of younger people who don't know. Maybe, maybe if we also had asked for the age of the person, that would be a little, a little different. Anyway, I want to go now to show you uh, the decision. Uh, the, the next slide. So let me go on to that because this is a short description of decision conferencing. <clears throat> It started out as a decision conference, but we discovered that sometimes you need more than one decision conference to resolve the issues. So it's one or more facilitated workshops, and it's attended by key players who represent the diversity of perspectives on the issues, which is crucial, facilitated by an impartial specialist in decision analysis who guides the process but doesn't contribute to the content, um, creates a requisite, which is a good enough model on the spot that provides structure to thinking and stimulates imagining alternative futures. So the, the phrase decision conferencing comes about because the decision part it means that whatever we're doing isn't just gathering data, it's, it's action oriented. We're presuming that some sort of actions will follow. And the conference is because it's a participative process. Therefore, these two together suggest that decision conferencing is a socio-technical discipline. It's not just an engineering technical one, it's a socio-technical discipline. Okay, so let me go on now to describe what happens in a decision conference. Somebody gets in touch with me there and I try to discuss with them, why did you call? What did you think? What do you want to do? What are your, what are your objectives? Why? Uh, 
who are the participants. We, d we devise a calling note to, to a decision conference if that seems to be the right thing to do. Of course, sometimes I discover it's not something I can help with, and uh, that's the end of the conversation. But presuming that we're going to go forward, we then have to decide who the key players are. And it is essential that there, all the perspectives, a key player is somebody who has a perspective on the issues that are being discussed that can help to resolve them. They could be stakeholders, but they don't have to be. They could be the people who actually own the problem, the decision maker who is accountable. But sometimes that person can't be present, in which case we've got to be sure that somebody is representing that person's views. Anyway, we go through three processes here. We, we explore the issues initially. We spend maybe an hour or two hours just saying, well, what do you want to talk about? After reminding people what the objectives are, of course, uh, as I did today. And then we build the model. That takes quite some time and take maybe a whole day, even next to the next into the next day. We explore the model very extensively. Now, while we're doing all these things, um, this is my engineering training saying that there should be an output from the key players about the exploring the issues. And that's the point when the key players are asked continuously, really, to say, how does this feel? Have we left something out? Is this going in the right direction and so forth? So intuition and gut feeling plays a model in a decision conferencing. Now, as all of these things are going, they help to feed what is building, and that's a shared understanding. That shared understanding also helps to create commitment so that people will actually act finally. But that any deviations, uh, any th thoughts about commitment could even go back to find out maybe we didn't have all the right key players and we need to have another workshop that brings in some more people. And finally, actions come out of all this. So there's the, the decision conferencing process. I'd now like to illustrate this with something um, that <laughs> you all ought to know something about. I think all of us have at one time or another taken a painkiller drug. And here are um, six drugs that we will be uh, talking about here. Now, they have slightly different names in some places. Uh, Nurofen is actually ibuprofen. And this is the tablet form. And this is Advil in the United States. And that's a liquid form. Uh, diclofenic we're going to use. Paracetamol in this country is acetaminophen in the United States or Tylenol. So I think these should all be familiar to you. It was Reckett Benkiser, the people who actually manufacture uh, the painkiller drug known as Nurofen, who wanted to compare their analgesic with those that can be purchased over the counter. And they gathered a uh, a few people from Reckett Van Kaiser who were experts in the drug, but they also um, asked outside experts to attend as well. When I'm working in drugs, I like two kinds of people. I like the experts who are often professors, but I also want clinicians who have experience. And I think this is generally true of almost every decision conference. You want some people at the cold face as well as people who have the theory in mind. We eventually developed this value tree. We call it now in the drug world, we call it an effects tree because we always have benefit effects and risk effects, which I've labeled here as safety effects. So these are all side effects over here. And these up here are uh, the benefits of taking a drug. Yeah, you get some pain relief, you expect it to ha happen for a long period of time and you want it to happen quickly. And these are adverse events, not too serious. These are serious adverse events which might send you into hospital. And there's even a potential which many people don't recognize of overdose toxicity, particularly with paracetamol. You can actually kill yourself by taking too many paracetamol tablets. Now, if this were the very first decision conference, we would be agreeing objectives well, they are to minimize, maximize benefits and, and maximize safety or alternatively minimize risks. We would be identifying the options, which I've already showed you on the previous page. And sometimes those are given, sometimes we have to identify them. 
Then we develop the benefit and safety criteria, creating operational definitions like for pain relief, it's the proportion of patients suffering moderate to severe pain who individually report pain intensity reduction by 50% or more. Okay, we might then go away. That might be a, a day's decision conference. On the next decision conference, we would now wish to fill in this table. This is the table with data. Up here, for example, the percentage of patients who really who were found to experience uh, pain relief were, well, those are all percentages. The next line is all about how many hours duration of action, the next one, the minutes. Um, and the skin reactions, that's actually the number. Now, the reason, of course, we do this, because we're doing this in step one, we're agreeing the data and the metrics, but we also have to decide on value functions because this is a form of multi-criteria decision analysis where all of these scales are going to be translated into zero to 100 scales. In this case, relatively with the least good one at zero and the best one at 100. But you'll notice that down here, suddenly they've all turned into zero to 100 scales. When we got to the, the uh, gastrointestinal effects, they said, well, there aren't any random controlled trials about this. And I said, what are you talking about? Today, millions of people worldwide must be, must be taking some of these drugs. You mean to say there are no controlled studies about this? And they said, that's correct. So we had to rely on the experts. And actually relying on the experts is basically the topic of my topic when we, uh, when I have uh, present when I present my paper at uh, uh, the DAG, uh, so you, you can hear more about that then. I've, I've highlighted these two. You see, paracetamol uh, does have hepatic effects, and also it's the one thing on which you, overdose toxicity can be serious. So when we're absent absent for data, then the experts can fill in from their experience and from their reading of observational studies in the literature, of which there are plenty. That's how they got these skin reactions. They, they, there are actually, that's the number of skin reactions. Those are the, the number that have been reported in the literature. Okay, on to the next one now. Once we've got all the, uh, all the data in the effects table, we can now assess, assess swing weights. Well, I assume you know about swing weighting. If not, you'll need to brush up on that because it's important to do it properly. In other words, you're looking at the bottom and the top of each zero to 100 scale and noting how large that difference is, sometimes in real world uh, uh, measures, but other times in preferences. Doesn't matter, you can do it either way. And the question is on scale A, What's the difference between the least and the most preferred? And how much do you care for that, care about that difference clinically, you know, for you personally, or if you're a prescribing physician, you would make a clinical judgment. And the same thing true of the other. How big are the differences between these two scales and how much do you care about that difference? You would then apply that, um, those swing weights appropriately for a hierarchical model, that is the, you'd start at the right of the model that I just showed the effects tree for and work to the left, always comparing the scale that has 100 with the other things next to it. And then finally, you would have enough weights that you could then apply the expected value and the weighted value equations in order to work out the final overall results and show them here as we've done in bar graphs. So here, is how beneficial the soluble ibuprofen is, and here's how safe it is. So more red means more safe, more blue means more beneficial. And then you engage participants and say, to see if those feel about right. And about 50% of the time, something isn't quite right. And then we try to explore that and go back and iterate through the process as per the previous diagram. Uh, about how a decision conference works. And we revise until finally people can generally agree, even though they may disagree about some details. So that's how we would 
conduct the third decision conference. So in three stages, it might happen like that. Um, of course, at some time, we might even have a fourth one, or we might combine this with the third one. We explore the model. So we might do a sensitivity analysis. Here, we would want to see, well, what happens if you change the weight on safety? If you put more weight or le less weight? Well, clearly, uh, ibuprofen tablets get a lot better, but already uh, ibuprofen soluble is very good. So ibuprofen comes out very well. And then two and four, naproxen and doxyphenic are, are next myths. And then five and six, paracetamol and aspirin are not so good. Um, by the way, remember these are zero to 100 scales. Um, having a score of only about 10 doesn't mean that aspirin's no good. It's just mean, or very poor. It just means uh, compared to the rest, it scores low. Or you might want to look at a, what we call a dominance analysis. Uh, most unusually, one thing here dominates. It is the most, both the most safe and the most beneficial as ibuprofen solids soluble. Usually you got a picture, imagine that one isn't there. You, the, the blue port then would go to two and then it would go down to three and then down. You usually have a diagonal here because something is very beneficial but not so safe and something else is very safe but not so beneficial. So this was a great surprise to everybody. And we can immediately see that one dominates two, four, five, and six. It's, it's better at this level of the analysis in both safety and benefits. And finally, we might want to compare, as Reckitt Benkiser did, they wanted to compare their tablet with paracetamol. So we compare those two, and these are the weighted difference scores of the preference scores, the weighted difference scores. And you'll notice that um, what we've got here is the main difference between them is the overdose toxicity. That's what favors ibuprofen, but the speed of onset is what uh, uh, is better for paracetamol. Now that suggests that you might well wish to say, well, that's just, this is a model that works in general because it's based on assumptions about sort of an average patient. If we wanna make decisions in the future, we might well now bring in a group of experts, and I'm doing this currently for another a pharmaceutical company who will say, you know, there are different kinds of patients. There are some patients who might be suffering from severe um, neuropathic pain uh, and that it's, it's just continuous. And they might be very different from people who are just taking a, some painkiller because they wanted pain relief from perhaps um, some muscle that has been overstressed or overworked. And you could then change the weights. You could go back and change weights. You could change scores. And you might eventually come up with recommendations that are different for this class of patients and those classes of patients. Now, that's exactly what we did. And I'm going to say more about this in April when we were working on a nuclear waste. We actually took the model out, not the model, but the uh, criteria, and we showed them the definitions of the bottoms and the tops of each of the scales and asked them to assess weights. So we did it to different interest groups who are concerned about uh, issues of um, the policy that the UK government should adopt for nuclear waste. And we got different answers back on the weights in particular uh, by, all, by many of these different interest groups. And so we could compare and that would help of course to form policy. So that's how we work forward to the future. Now, I think that pretty well exhausts what I have to say. So I have just this last slide. And I wanna point out that an orderly process is often the result of getting things right just from the start. So you need to spend time with your client exploring the model, the, the purpose of the modeling, choose the right key players who represent diversity and ex expertise, both practical expertise and who know th about theory, and finally ensure that all perspectives on the issues are represented. Okay, with that now,
I'm ready to go over to the experts, but first there's time for questions. Yeah, shall we take some questions, Larry? Okay, um, let's do that. Okay, so I have some, some nice questions here. Let me just start by um, one um, question from the audience. I said, what if the participants cannot agree on decision policy? What do you do? Okay, well, they often don't agree. So, <laughs> um, that's the whole point of finding out why they disagree. And there are two things that can happen. And one is that they're mixing two things together that should be separate criteria. You only will get that by exploring why they, why they disagree with one another. If they seriously dis, and then and then I say to, in fact, if if I get a lot of disagreements in a group, I will try to find out the the most extreme people in the group, and I will ask the most positive person to say why they're so positive, and not allow any discussion. Then the negative person, and no discussion, and now discuss this. Everybody in the group, join the discussion. You've heard the pros and the cons. Now let's discuss it. I can guarantee by the end of that process, the difference in the group will, will have um, reduced substantially. I've actually tried it out many times, got histograms of how people were thinking. And uh, eventually the narrowness is good enough that it's within plus or minus five or 10 points on a 100 point scale. And then we just choose the median group. And that seems to be satisfying everybody. If it doesn't, I ask the most extreme person who's holding out, hold it, and we will sense we will subject it to sensitivity analysis at the end of this process. But now let's go on with the next step. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I have another question, uh, an interesting one. It says, uh, is there a limit on the number of participants that you can have in a decision conference? Theoretically, no, and um, I've, I've even done one with as many as 60 people, and some of my colleagues in the U.S. have done it with even more. Ideally, the number of participants might be between 6 and 12. This is kind of like, um, you know, if you have too few, you have a, it's like a jazz combo. You know, you get these wonderful solos from individuals, but occasionally they play together. Uh, if you get a big orchestra, there's not so much room for individuals to participate. The balance is about right between eight and 12. So that would be my ideal. Okay, thank you. Um, I, there's another question here, uh, an interesting one. It says, how does the exploring the issues step that you describe in your slides differ from the sort of a traditional decision framing sort of a process? Uh, 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 that uh, we hear in decision analysis. Well, are there any of these strategies developed or, or, or used specifically in this step? It's possible, as I indicated in my diagram, it's possible that you discover in sensitivity analysis that you've got something seriously wrong and you have to go back to reframe the problem because you've just done the, you've just uh, pr produced a good, good solution to the wrong problem. That can happen. Is that what the questioner meant? Um, I, 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 I think so. I think the, the, I think they were just comparing the two. You know, in decision analysis, uh, we we hear about you know framing the, the the decision was very important and and whether there's something specific or, or, or very different from from that in in your exploration. Um, uh, do you use any formal tools? I think that's what that's what it means. Oh, I see. Uh, Yes, the framing process, you can, there, there are a variety of tool, tools that you can use to help frame the problem as, well, Ralph Keeney has written very well about these. How do you get people to think about more criteria or how do they think of how to think about more uh, alternatives? You, there are tools to be applied, uh, but generally they would be applied at the start. Uh, yeah. And um, framing is, you know, at the beginning of the process and sensitivity analyses are at the end. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Is, uh, uh, is this, are there any classes of decisions for which decision conferences might not be appropriate? Probably, but of course, they, no, I don't get those clients. So, so, <laughs> so I think maybe other people might be better in a better position to uh, answer that question uh, than I am. Uh, but, but yeah, 
many things are cleared up just by an exchange of information. You have to remember that I work as a process consultant. I, I'm not there to solve their problem. My role is to help somebody else who's got some difficult issues or a problem is to help them to resolve the issues. And, I, mm -hmm. and that's very different from, uh, you know, the doctor patient relationship. Uh, with, well, yeah, occasionally it, as now I'm trying to share my expertise, but generally that's not how I work. Okay, final question before we move on. Uh, uh, question of time. Uh, how do you make the difference between stakeholders and key players? Do you only include experts in your decision conferences, or how about, for example, citizen participation? Uh, oh, sometimes we have patients. Yeah, I, I've had a, some recent um, decision conferences. Uh, well, a recent one on uh, medical cannabis and how it can help neuropathic pain. And we had two people who represented um, patients who suffer neuropathic pain. Uh, so yeah, it, it, they, to my mind, are key players. Yes, um, you can't always. If you're working with charities, it's easy because the charities will always volunteer patients, and you, what you want is a knowledgeable patient. Some patients can be a pain in the neck because they just they're just got one thing on their mind and they just keep saying that over and over again. But what you want are knowledgeable people, people who are knowledgeable about the topic and who could contribute something, even though uh, they don't own the problem. Sometimes you have stakeholders who don't have any authority over the problem. Um, you can think about it negatively. Is there somebody who was eliminate, who was not asked to be on the decision conference who might read the results and say, whoa, you completely forgot about X? Well, yes, especially if that's somebody higher up in your organization and you have forgotten to represent their, their perspectives. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. There are so, so many questions. I, I, I have to apologize for not taking all of them, but if there's time towards the end, we'll, 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 we'll go back to those questions as well. So uh, let's just move on now and hand it over to Patrick, uh, uh, Edgar and Paul, um, if they're ready. Are Paul and Edward joining us? There we go. There you are. Good, good day, everybody. It's 2.30 in the morning here in, uh, in Australia, so I don't know what time of day it is elsewhere in the world. <laughs> Over to you. Morning, everybody. Thank you. So uh, perhaps we'll jump in, Edward. Um, uh, and thanks, Larry. It's always a privilege to be uh, in the same virtual room as you and uh, enjoying your uh, knowledge and expertise. So uh, um, a privilege to be here. Uh, so I'm just going to um, pop up a couple of slides to support um, Edward and my conversation. And uh, hopefully you can see that. Is that showing, gentlemen? That's showing your teams, Paul, rather than the slides. Is it? Well, that's interesting. Okay. Let me just see. Aha, I'm not supposed to because I need to do that. Just one second. There we are. Let's try that. Can you see some slides now? We'll get there. Great. Thank you. So um, I guess where we the, sort of our recent experiences is is, is uh, in how everything that Larry's just been talking about can apply in an environment that's where there's constraints on how you can put people together in a room, and uh, and so what we'd like to kind of uh, I guess talk through uh, very briefly just to give you a flavour of uh, kind of what we found is working and not working is how can you do all those techniques that uh, Larry just described in a way where you can't put people physically face to face. And uh, we thought it, to bring it alive, we talk about some real activities. So, uh, and Edward and I, um, Edward over in New Zealand, so he's uh, in Wellington as we speak, um, we'll just cover a few of the particular re very recent activities that have happened. And all of these activities have happened since uh, this global pandemic hit and since, of course, the ability to get people together 
has been restricted. Um, the first one I'm just going to mention briefly is some work with the Australian Department of Defence on looking at their uh, prioritisation and understanding of the strategic risk environment. And this is a very interesting example because this, they've been running this over a period of time. The first time we ran a decision conferencing activity, it was in person exactly as Larry described, uh, and that you know was very successful, got some great results. Then they said, right, time to uh, revisit six months later, right in the middle of the pandemic. And the biggest challenge for them is all the material they're dealing with is classified. So uh, techniques for virtual participation weren't able to be used. And we ended up with a paper-based solution, which uh, is kind of, you could, you could say backwards innovation, where we went away from using any technology, any uh, computer-based modeling uh, into some papers that were distributed to the participants. And they completed some of their assessments and judgments. They were combined back together remotely. Uh, and then the results reflected back. Um, and then the lesson from that was, it was effective, but I would say it probably only got us a 60% solution. And so when actually they were able to get back in person again uh, to a person, all the stakeholders said, let's go back to meeting when we can. So I think there's an interesting lesson there that uh, that was an experiment was successful, but it was a very much a, a need to must. So that's the uh, Department of Defence, Edward. So the New Zealand Ministry of Transport during COVID wanted to look at all of the investments that they were making in New Zealand and think about how they might be prioritised differently if you wanted to get stimulus in the economy as a result of um, coming out the back end of the pandemic experience. So what we did there was we ended up looking at a number of different portfolios that were built up over time. So a series of decision conferences, with a mixture of both the same and different participants over a series of time to build first a portfolio in a particular set of projects, then to fold in all the rail projects, and then finally to fold in um, a whole series of new options that people were thinking about that would particularly stimulate quick um, economic activity in New Zealand in the infrastructure space. Paul. Thank you. Uh, so following that, and I think Edward wants to just show exactly how that looks in just a moment. Um, and uh, so we then uh, were doing another decision conference, this time in the oil and gas space, looking at options for decommissioning a major piece of infrastructure in uh, off the west coast of Australia. And uh, that had to be done in, in completely virtually. Um, and actually the opportunity of doing that virtually was that we could have multi-state participation across the, the whole of Australia. So that was done over a single day with participants from the government, with participants from uh, the oil and gas company. Um, and actually, this is an interesting example. We've run many of these in person, and this was the first one we did entirely virtually. And this is one of those examples, as the questioner asked earlier, where uh, some of those participants are people such as um, fishermen who operate fishing boats in the area where the decommissioning is going to be happening. So they're very much uh, impacted stakeholders rather than experts in uh, in the oil and gas infrastructure. So it's been a great way to have them to be able to participate because they could participate remotely. So for Auckland Transport, unlike the Ministry of Transport, we are basically we, we had no choice but to do the whole thing virtually, start right from the outset and doing all the scoring in a virtual environment. In the case of Auckland Transport, New Zealand had come out of lockdown. So we started a conference, a, a, um, a traditional decision conference in person in the room with all the, the stakeholders and participants. We'd only got through the first day when 10 o'clock at night, the client rings up and says, Auckland's going into lockdown at eight o'clock in the morning. You need to be on an aeroplane out of here and we want to finish the work. So great, we've done this before. We know that we can just hop on an aeroplane, fly to Wellington, and the next day be ready to go by switching it to virtually just with the generation of a few slides. So, you know, the ability to both do it digitally, and in this case, suddenly be able to swap from in the room to digitally in a seamless way. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, and final example to talk about is uh, working in the Department of Home Affairs uh, here in Australia. And this was happening after the severe restrictions had happened, so people, we could get people together in person, but very limited on numbers because of room size. So uh, the challenge there was, what do we do about that? And in fact, their own internal policy was trying to have them do the whole thing virtually. And from the lessons, particularly uh, the lessons that um, Edward <coughs> learned in Auckland, we decided to do a short piece where people got together in the physical environment to provide for all of that social process that allowed people to build rapport with each other, understand perspectives, and then we migrated to a virtual environment. 
one of the particular features of that activity, there was one person participating who uh, couldn't come to the physical environment and had no access to video conferencing because they were calling from a highly secure facility. So they participated in an audio conference only. And uh, that was a very interesting challenge to have everyone else together or then on video conference and one person on audio conference. And I think over the course of the uh, two days, they were sent about 300 screenshots from the video via email that they could then interact with for themselves and then participate over the phone. So that was quite an interesting example. Edward, did you want to uh, talk to? So next slide. Okay, so what does that actually look like in, in practice? Larry's talked about his process, so you know, um, this is in the context of having built a, a model and uh, wanting to evaluate the model against a set of criteria that have been defined in advance in a series of workshops all in advance of the actual decision conference itself. So just quickly thought I'd show you what our um, scoring looks like when we're using relative preference scales. You know, we'd do this literally, you know, as you can see now in the room with people and basically we'd have those conversations around, in this case, the environmental criteria, have a series of options and we'd want to be getting these options scored on the scale. So basically, you know, we'd literally go through the usual process of asking people how they would rank these um, options first, get them in a rank order, and then basically, you know, I would have Paul drag the, um, the options onto the scale as um, the conversations unfolded and people decided on the scores. So, you know, if I have 54, Auckland to Hamilton electrification was at the top of the scale, we just drag that across and people could actually see their conversations and their scores come to life as we built up the options on the scale. Reasonably low tech, it's just a PowerPoint slide with everything locked in the background, the labels locked down in advance, but very effective at recreating what we would normally do in the room, which would be with a whiteboard and a series of magnets. Um, you know, the beauty of this is we can quickly adjust scores, we can get feedback, um, and we can do this at pace um, with a room full of people. The value is in the conversation. The PowerPoint and the technology is just helping visualize the conversations they're having in a way that people get that shared understanding of um, what their judgments are. Okay, I think Patrick's gonna- Patrick, I'm gonna jump in with your perspectives. Yes, and so I've got a, um, a much lower tech piece of commentary to make. Uh, so I've been running um, most of my decision conferences as you see here. Uh, so I have my my flip chart behind me. I can actually put two flip charts up there the way I've, I've got it rigged up. Um, I like to work over Zoom. I find it the most um, effective platform. I work with a slightly different client base than um, what Paul and Edward have identified there and different again from what Larry mentioned earlier, tends to be um, executive teams, small groups, very senior people um, and um, over the course of the pandemic, most of the work I've done has been with teams that I already have a relationship with. Um, and that's been really important for um, establishing a way of working together remotely. Uh, unlike Paul and Edward, uh, my experience is that these things work best in small slices. And so I tend to do two hour Zoom calls. Um, I find that people's attention deteriorates quite rapidly after that, uh, particularly senior executives, because we know what they're like. Um, and, uh, and so I, I tend to do a, a series of two hour slots. Um, and at some point that will or often turns into, not always, but often turns into the sort of computer output that Larry demonstrated before. Uh, but to the question, Alberta, that you had a little while ago about the framing of things, um, my experience is that a lot of the work that I do, the value is in the framing. Um, you know, it's that thing from Herb Simon, that good problem solving uh, consists of finding a representation of the problem uh, where the solution becomes obvious. And so uh, a lot of the work I do in, it is, it's decision conferencing, it's getting people to think about criteria, to think about options, to think about scores, um, but often it's in the preliminary alignment of people around what actually is the problem here and how might we 
structure this in a way that we can come to understand it, that people, particularly senior executives with strategic problems, um, can move quite quickly to a shared understanding of what's required next. Uh, without a doubt, there are times when you, uh, I need to get into the sort of detail that Larry and Paul and Edward have spoken about, um, but for me and in the work that I do, it's in that problem framing part uh, where clients tell me that I add the most value. Um, and I can do that all very simply here, um, and it, it's quite requisite, very low tech, but quite requisite. Excellent, Patrick. Can I, can I, can I pause a little bit to take some questions? Um, there's one question here uh, that, that, is, uh, um, that is, I think uh, is quite interesting, uh, and I'd like to invite uh, perhaps Paul to, to, to comment on this. So in virtual conferences, for example, uh, that you have live online, um, how do you address or mitigate the irresistible temptation that participants have to mute and multitask? <laughs> Great question. Um, I would say a few things that we've learned. The first thing we've learned is uh, actually when we're having a, a the, the sort of active participants of a decision conference, everyone has their video on the whole time and everyone is off mute. And I know that normally goes against all of the lessons of, uh, of video conferencing, but uh, we've noticed that firstly, as soon as you're on mute, you spend half the decision conference saying you're on mute, we can't hear you. And so that distracts the conversation. And secondly, if people are on mute and with no video, then we know they're off, uh, you know, feeding the dog or playing with the kids or uh, having their nails painted by their three year old. Um, and uh, and so what we do is say, no, we're going to make this as if it were in the room. We behave the same way as if you were sitting around a table. Everyone's on video. No one's on mute. And you participate that way. And that ha actually has been very effective. One would also say, of course, I know Larry will nod at this one. Of course, it's the responsibility of the facilitator to have the conversation so engaging that, of course, everyone's hanging on every conversation and no one wants to be distracted. <clears throat> and and, and um, Paul, what I'd add to that is that um, it, it's one of the reasons why I find Zoom a better platform to work on than Teams, um, because the, the way you can see people on the screen, particularly if you've got more than about nine people, um, is much more effective on Zoom. And another thing that I utilise in the same way that I would use table groups in a real room setting um, is to use the breakout function in Zoom um, to just change the dynamic a little bit and give people a chance to have a conversation with a small group and then bring that back to a conversation with the large group. That's, that's excellent. I, I, there was a question about breakout rooms as well, so obviously you, you, you just commented on that and, and addressed the question. I, I have a question that uh, uh, perhaps I'd I, I like to uh, hear all of you to, to comment on. So when you are in a decision conference, uh, say face-to-face, -face, in person, uh, you know, one of the one of the purposes is, of course, uh, to, to gain some shared understanding, consensus, you know, moving forward together. But when you are in a, in a room with with people, you can sort of uh, um, physically recognize if somebody is gaining agreement. You know, you can see each other, and and, and you can recognize that you are moving forward. What are, what's the challenge when you are in a virtual environment? Because obviously, of course, we can see the screens, but it's a bit different, isn't it? What's, what's your experience? I mean, in anyone? Absolutely. So um, I'll chip in first. So my experience with this is that one of the challenges is keeping your head in the room, in the virtual room. Um, so the trick to that is just as I was doing when Paul was helping me, is not to be facilitating and driving the technology yourself. I found it the hardest thing in the world to give up my whiteboard marker and my magnets myself and let the mouse be driven by somebody else. But it's something you've got to do. That way you can be in the room, you can feel the participants and you are with them and you can concentrate. Um, that creates much more of an in the room experience than if you're trying to um, you know, juggle different things at once. The other thing that I'd say is um, subtly different from Paul Sometimes when we've got a decent sized group of people to maximize their presence on the screen, I might only have those who are participating in the conversation, the evaluators on screen, and have the SMEs and the support people in the room off screen for the scoring conversations so that the group is more intimate. And that again helps build that connection in the virtual environment. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, anybody else want to chip in or are you happy to move to a different yeah, question? Just to make an observation, um, Alberto, that um, it, I, I've been interested, you know, watching myself in, in this space. So I've spent well, probably 40 years um, working with real groups of people in real rooms, in real life and so on. Um, and one builds a set of skills for that. Um, I've noticed how those skills have slowly morphed into their equivalents in the virtual world over the last 12 months or so. Um, and can I read a screen as well as I can read real people in a real room? I, I don't know that we'll ever get to that, but can I um, very effectively ascertain what's happening with the group so long as all their cameras are on and it's Zoom, so you've got good visibility? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but it's taken a little while to get to that point. Excellent. Thank you. One, There's another question one. from the audience here about uh, the sort of uh, the idea idea gathering uh, bit when you when you're starting the process. And, and the question is whether you're using any any formal tools like, for example, uh, uh, Google Jamboard, you know, for idea gathering or any other sort of a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, tool that, uh, that that you use to to gather ideas quickly. Uh, do you have any experience on that? I'll I'll ask uh, uh, Paul first. Um, the, the short answer, Alberto, is we tend to use the same sort of tools we would use were we in a real environment. So sometimes we use collaborative whiteboarding for collecting ideas together. Sometimes we use real whiteboarding by just having one on the on the wall here and start scribbling, much like Patrick um, has, has described. I wouldn't say we've used anything that's specifically oriented towards online. Partly, I guess, because we're it's very much about that collaboration, and the more it's a, a, let's call it an analog kind of conversation, the more people are inclined to kind of jump in and the ideas come. That, that's that's my experience. Okay. Um, Patrick. I've used um, Miro a couple of times um, we, when I've had slightly larger groups um, and that's worked quite well. Um, it, it, for me, it, you, you lose some of the intimacy of the conversation um, and whenever I can, I like to work in this, you know, slightly lower tech way. Um, but for larger groups, I have used Miro a few times uh, and it can be quite useful. Excellent. I, I have another question here, which is, which is about um, uh, working with groups that have no history. So, uh, and, and the question there, I mean, we, we know that about, uh, you know, in sort of a standard decision conferences, that that's in itself an issue. But does the virtual environment makes it even more difficult? So when you're having a group that never worked before, does that present a particular challenge to you? Maybe Edward can, can start that. Yeah, in, in many ways, no, it's no different because you can have people in the room who are coming together for a decision conference and they've got no experience of being in the room together. I think the thing is how you set it up at the beginning and how you take a, just a little bit of time to get the group familiar with each other. So, you know, always making a few minutes available to just get a sense of, you know, who the person is, who the stakeholders they're representing is, you know, anything that they kind of want to get into the room. And just that little bit of building the relationship between people can really kind of get things going. Uh, and sometimes people have found it actually easier because there's, in some ways, there's fewer distractions once they're, you know, in a room virtually than, um, you know, potentially being in an actual room where they might also be, you know, trying to juggle other things or, you know, talking to people who are over their shoulder. Excellent. Can I just add, add it, it, it also does help level things out a little bit because, of course, often you have groups where some people have worked together and others haven't. And if those people are having a bit of a conversation in a room, then the people who haven't worked with them can be excluded. And so some of that gets leveled out as well by everyone kind of on, in their own box, so to speak. Mm. Excellent. I have one very good question from the audience uh, uh, that, that, you know, that technology allows this. So is it a good idea to record the workshop if you're using Zoom or you're using uh, um, you know, Teams or, 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 or one of those uh, platforms? So we've recorded them, not because, um, you know, for, for a couple of purposes, primarily just to make sure that if we miss something in the conversations that, you know, and our note taking isn't perfect, we've got a, a means of going back to it. 
My experience is generally that people kind of forget that the recording is even on once they get underway and get engaged in it. So while it might seem like a big deal in advance, actually in practice, I think it's a whole lot less of a deal. Um, you know, it may be that for some really contentious stuff, people would be less comfortable about it. But, you know, in my experience is actually, it's not really the big deal that people might think it is. Um, can I just butt in here and say, yes, uh, originally in oh, decision no. conferences, we made a comment. We, we used to say there's a rule that there is, are no recordings. We relaxed that eventually, but I think it's correct that it's a bad idea to record if it's a new group. It's okay if it's a familiar group, but not for a new group. They aren't ready for that. It, they, 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 they need the confidence uh, of working together, and, and that they're not going to be recorded and, and later held to account for what they said. Excellent, Larry. So one final question we, before we, we, we finish. Uh, whether you're using this in a virtual environment or in sort of a face-to-face -face environment, do you, uh, from your experience, do you introduce the principles of decision sciences or decision confidence to your participants before you start? Anyone? Uh, so I'll jump in oh. and say yes, sufficiently to have them. The main reason we, we would introduce those principles is to not have them be a barrier later on. So, uh, in, and actually, we use a lot of the same briefing material in a virtual environment that we'd use in a real environment for exactly that same purpose. <coughs> So that's Thank the short you. answer. Thank you. Patrick? Gentle, gentlemen, I'm afraid I have to stop. Uh, okay. Our time is, is running out. <laughs> so I Thank know that we could spend maybe probably more three hours here discussing these exciting <laughs> topics. Uh, but I think before we, we finish, I would just like to thank Larry for the fantastic talk. And also for the vision. I, I, I said this when I introduced you. I think it's not about being a pioneer, only a pioneer, but also it's about being a visionary. And I do think that that's the future. So. I'm delighted that Patrick, Paul, and Edward shared their innovative ways of doing decision conferencing, which I think is, is going to, to stay and, and prosper. Thank you, Alberto, for being such a good moderator. And before we finish, uh, I would just like to say a big thank you to Brig Mazon. She, um, um, she has been the um, SDP. Um, manager that has organized all our webinars in, on, on behalf of SDP in the SDP uh, webinar series. We'd like to thank her because she's now living for uh, uh, another opportunities in her life. Unfortunately, we are very sad. So Brig, many thanks indeed, all the best. And we just want to thank you again for organizing such brilliantly, such uh, good webinars. And also thanks Hilda also for the continuous support. So thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Keep safe and see you in March, on the 3rd of March for our next webinar. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thank you, Gilberto, and thank you to our team of experts today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, th this concludes today's learning exchange. I'd like to thank our presenters again and also the attendees for their valuable questions and their time and all the contributions to today's event. I'd like to uh, remind you that you will find the replay of this webinar and all previous webinars in the Society of Decision Professionals members only section of our website at decisionprofessionals.com. Thank you for being with us today and you may now disconnect. Have a good day, evening, morning, wherever you may be in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Bye-bye.